What's up and welcome to a special episode of the Upland Show. Today we have a special guest. We have Ben68 that we're going to bring on stream. Ben68, welcome to the Upland Show and uh, thanks for thanks for being willing to be on the show. Thank you for reaching out and getting me on. Yeah, absolutely. So one thing that a lot of the community knows and that I, has always stuck out to me is, and I, I'm not sure if you take credit, but Ben68 to me is kind of the founder, if you will, of nodes in Upland. And nodes have become really impactful, I think, to the overall game and strategy of playing Upland. It's not just going after collections, not just going after val valuing properties that way, but valuing collection or, or valuing neighborhoods and properties in a different way through nodes. So how, how did that idea even start and how did you get involved with helping to create some of the first nodes? Well, it's, it's kind of a bit convoluted and confused, um, however you want to say it, because there was um, many people that were running their own neighborhoods, as it were, way back in the day. Um, you know, Alamo Square, Dog Patch. There's a whole whole bunch of them from the, the kind of OG players. Yeah. And there was plenty of that going around. And I was the same myself. Like, I, when Upland first announced that there was going to be businesses released, that's when I decided, okay, well, I'm going to start taking this game a little bit more seriously. And I looked around the map in San Francisco at the time, which it's probably hard for people nowadays to imagine, but there was just swathes of the map just completely unminted. Yep. So I had a, had a good look around it, and I knew what I wanted for my business immediately, like the theme and everything like that. So based on that, which is Samurai Aquatics, um, kind of there's a lot of my background history that is related to that. So Samurai Aquatics, I wanted... I was either looking for a neighborhood that was on the coastline or okay. I wanted I wanted uh, like a street address that kind of matched in with that theme. So I spent probably, I don't know, a week or something like that having a good look around the map. And this, again, this is back in the days where there was no Upex World. There was no online tools. Yeah. It was back in the pen and paper days. Like I remember scrolling the map for days, pen and paper, like trying to find the cheapest property to mint, like, there's sure there's one there for 2500 but i know if i keep looking there'll be a cheaper one yeah and it's literally Just manual manually scroll. scrolling <laughs> yeah so i i looked around and yeah i found aqua vista way in midtown terrace which is pretty much bang smack right in the middle of middle of san francisco yeah and it just so happens that there was one big massive property there 30 aqua vista way and it was actually minted but it was on on sale i think it was 150 200k something like that so at the time i was like damn that's a lot of that's a lot of apex but i had a look around the map it looked like a really good layout and based on the information we had at hand i, I thought you know what this looks like a really good spot so i purchased that property and it turns out that was from a like one of the og og players and oh, that cool. had been sitting there f since probably since the day he minted it uncollected yeah. dividends so i think i got I think it was like 9k dividends or something it was something crazy that i got for dividends as a bit of a bonus so that was nice that is nice a lot yeah a lot of people don't realize that if they leave their dividends uncollected when a property is purchased uh you get to collect all the uncollected dividends so yeah, yeah that's yeah that's and then a that's good as little a bonus. Kind of, yeah as a <laughs> side note that became a that became a thing where you know how small the community was we're like because i told the people that i was in touch with and we, we started scrolling the map looking for these really old accounts and picking a few up here and there to get some bonus upex so if they smart. weren't priced too crazily wow so, yeah. that, that is a strategy i have not heard uh being <laughs> utilized yet but that is genius yeah yes yeah, so so from that aqua vista way started there and then i s minted out that block and then i kind of started a small underground push to get midtown terrace sold out and that kind of snowballed and we sold that out and Midtown Terrace United was formed basically. So that was going to be my little neighborhood area. So again, this is this is exactly what a whole bunch of other people had done. There was all sorts of stuff like people were declaring themselves the the mayor of the neighborhood and it was all a bit yeah. wanky, but it was it was a bit of fun. So yeah, we we were pretty much exactly the same. It wasn't until Actually, it actually happened really quick. Um, I forget the exact timeline, but 
it was like maybe a couple of weeks later that another player, a huge player, came into the game from out of nowhere. And he was kind of one of the first people to really start throwing some serious money down. And he sent me a DM one night and said, oh, have a look what i got going on in Balboa Terrace. And he'd essentially seen what I was doing and what other people are doing. And he'd done the exact same thing, minted out all of Balboa Terrace. Yeah. And with three conversations with him, like he had his plans for what he wanted to do in his neighborhood. I had my plans and we decided to come together and work together. And that's where, that's where Upland Development United kicked off. So that was the, cool. that's like the umbrella brand. So, so that's, that's where the whole terminology of Node came from. So we have our UDU, as we call it, the Upland Development United. That's the umbrella brand. And then my neighborhood project was attached to that and his neighborhood project was attached to that. So cool. the original Node concept was that it was separate projects coming together where the term, you know, we started doing weekly meetings and publishing our meetings every single mm -hmm. week. And through that, the kind of the terminology got out into the wider community and it kind of took on a life of its own. And it did. It got it got to the point where any man and his dog with, you know, two or three properties in the neighborhood were saying, Oh, this is a node. And, you know, at, at the start we were we were like, um, that's not a node, mate. This is a node, like, you know, like crocodile and these stuff. <laughs> and we kind of pushed back pretty hard against it, but it just became it was just became overwhelming and you know it was probably i don't know three four five months ago something like that we just said you know what you, you could call it whatever you want um so since then we've seen that node the term itself has just expanded into a whole different things because you know we've, we've seen like mini projects like the gay ab initiative and things like that where technically as far as our original terminology it wouldn't be considered a node but you know it's the main thing is it's it's an area where there's community people getting together, working together. That's the biggest thing. So. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, I'm curious, what was the timeline with like being able to build buildings on your properties and and kind of the first node you got? What were were you already having these ideas before building came into play, like permanent? Oh, absolutely. Permanent buildings. Yeah. Yeah, I'd have to check. Um... I'll have to check my YouTube channel for the exact timing because I remember I released one of the first videos where because when when building first came online it it wasn't just wide open to the public um, there was like a test period yeah so exactly it, yeah it, it and wasn't so like wide open. I I guess how did I'm curious how like when buildings came into play how that did that evolve your plans for nodes d d did you already know that was going to be the plan when you started the whole idea of nodes or what was kind of the thinking there oh yeah it was absolutely the plan like um we had not a white paper but it was essentially that's what it was in everything but name like when we first yeah. got together with that concept like the very first udu team meeting was we were going through that and it was outlining you know within midtown terrace I had separated a residential area from a business area and we had yeah, a whole bunch of plans in place for what we were going to actually do. So yeah, there was, it was definitely a case of waiting for the, waiting for the team to catch up with what we'd already got kind of ready to go. Yeah, exactly. And I, I remember watching when building permanent buildings first started, I mean, Midtown Terrace was just killing it. Right, like I, it was number one, right? Like from from the er, er, early days, I feel like it was up there with like the neighborhoods being built out the most, the most spark being allocated towards it. You definitely had rallied a big community around it, and I think that is, as you mentioned, kind of the the key component of nodes is like how getting as much of the community involved in on that project as needed and yep. working together. I I, I think. A lot of this talk recently of about about metaverse projects needing to have community. I think nodes are a key part of building and creating community within the game, and I, and I really look up to the efforts you put in to to create that. Yeah, a lot of it comes down to um, having some kind of leadership structure in place. Like we've seen, we've seen so many node projects basically fizzle and die or blow up because there hasn't been 
there either hasn't been a clearly defined leadership or there's been, you know, internal struggles where for whatever reasons they haven't been able to, you know, work through the drama. There's any of these kind of community situations, there's always some element of drama that you've got to deal with, yeah. whether that's internal, or external. So yeah, that that's probably that's probably just as important as having a plan. Like, yeah, some of these projects they they have all the ideas in the world, but unless you actually put in the work it's it's not going to go anywhere you know exactly. it's definitely a case of if you want to get involved in a node it's i always say to people it's you shouldn't be coming in thinking what can i get out of this it should be you know what can i contribute to this yeah it's a very different mindset and but then we do see other node projects where they're all about and then open to we are just here to pump the floor so you know there's of a very wide spectrum so to speak. yeah yeah yeah, I and it has proven to do that, right? Like I'm sure the cost to get into a Midtown Terrace property right now is not cheap, right? Like I'm sure it has it, that that is an effect of creating a node, but it's not the entire the entire goal, right? Well, it it was for us because as as the kind of original node creators, we had set ourselves very clear um, requirements for it to be considered a node. So we internally, we don't consider it a neighborhood node unless we own, the team owns 61% um, of the properties available. Um, and that's just so that we can continue to guide the development, you know, and yeah. maintain control and have a little bit of a buffer because there's always, like I said, there's always going to be drama. You're always going to have people that lose interest or bail out for whatever reason. So that's a little bit different. So to maintain that we purposely pump the floor to get it out of the hands of flippers because going back yeah. to the san francisco days like um once udu formed um we became one of the leading pushes of selling out san francisco like we would coordinate we'd talk about okay we're going to go for lone mountain this week and we'd all get together okay it was you know it was a bit of fun three two one go and we would all descend on one neighborhood and, and just, just all start buying it yeah and there was people within the community who and this is back when you couldn't hide block explorers so people would see where our block explorers would go and then they would essentially piggyback on and be trying to mint ahead of us and that sort of thing so it, it was a lot of fun we got to we got to the point where it was the same characters doing this multiple times so we'd set we'd set um um red herring so two or three of us would go to one neighborhood and start minting <laughs> a few there. We'd see those people jump over and mint there and then everyone else is minting the actual target. So there was a whole bunch of fun involved. Crazy. Yeah, yeah that's awesome. Um, so I'm curious, what is like some, in your mind, some of the coolest like parts of the long-term visions that a node could have? And like, instead of just a community coming together and owning 60% or more of a, of a neighborhood, what is actually some of the goals that you think some nodes can develop and work towards? Well, the big thing and another reason why it all started was the idea that um, if there was enough development within a certain neighborhood, you could spawn an, a neighborhood collection. So that that's that was probably the biggest carrot. Um, we still don't know how that's going to play out. And yeah. Morchi's at the Genesis event, she asked about renting and that sort of stuff and the team pretty much it was really funny to watch that was like they were sitting on the panel and it was like a mexican wave of blank stairs that went down and then back and so there, there's not a whole lot of information there that we know about that is whether that's still going to be a thing or not so that was one of the, the main parts uh another part was just to see uh recently when the midtown terrace was in one of the temporary tracks for racing and thank me later and russell envy were were showing what it looks like to drive through midtown terrace and it just looked incredible compared to you know some of the more open areas so yeah i think that's no, a good insight no buildings around. yeah yeah i think that's a good insight into layer two and what's to come absolutely absolutely so let's uh, uh th thanks for talking to us about nodes and teaching us some of your vision with nodes that is there anything else and uh, actually that you would want to discuss about nodes in general um uh, to share with people yeah i mean it's a great way if, if you're looking to get more deeply engaged in the game i don't think there's a better way to do it than get involved in a node project and like i said it, 
the whole concept has taken on a life of its own and there is now there's so many different teams or you know projects that are have all sorts of different influences and ideologies and that sort of stuff so there's limitless opportunities for you to get deeply involved and again it's it's what you put into these things so yeah reach out to people um have conversations with people and we, we encourage all our members to branch out into different projects start your own projects that sort of stuff so if, for me it's all about yeah getting more deeply engaged in the game in the community and that that's where the true value in upland is is in the community engagement and that sort of stuff i i believe anyway yeah, I agree. Net networking is a key part of that, and and I think being successful in many aspects of life. I'm, I mean, playing Upland, career, networking, creating community, and a, a group of people you can work together with is is a key component to just overall success with with so many things. So nodes have really been that way for Upland for community to come together, network, you know, group think. Uh, work together so that's that's really cool to see how how big it's expanded just since you know you and some other people started this original project and inspired so many others so it's so, it's so cool to see um i'm curious kind of how you got your start in upland um what piqued your interest and uh how the journey's been so far how deep do you want to go where, where do you want to kick it off at yeah, like how did you originally even hear about about Upland? Um, I first heard about Upland from the Bad Crypto podcast. So I okay. was actually I was actually doing my master's degree at the time and getting up at crazy AM, but I was finding myself getting too easily distracted down um, various you know podcasts and this that and the other thing. So I was in the process of um, unsubscribing and deleting a whole bunch of stuff and trying to get myself to purposely focus on my study so I could get it finished. And as I was looking through to see if there's anything else that I wanted to watch before I unsubscribed, there was one there that said, I forget the title, but it was something about um, Monopoly on the blockchain or something like that. And I thought, oh, well, I'll check this out. And I listened to that episode and signed up immediately and lost that day's worth of study and probably the next <laughs> week's worth of study. Um, got hooked pretty much immediately from the get-go. So, yeah, that was early January 2020. Okay, so was San Francisco the only city at the time that you joined? Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Okay. Yeah, yeah so I, I joined when it was Manhattan and Fresno, so I was a little bit later. But Yeah. yeah but no, that it was still San Francisco and Manhattan and Fresno, none of it was sold out. When like There was no such thing as a city being sold out when I joined. But you, you were there when it was just San Francisco. There was probably a ton of property is still available just in San Francisco. Yeah, well, treasure hunting was really hard because there was just nothing minted. It's Again, it's probably hard for people to imagine, but San Francisco was a ghost town. There was The community was maybe, maybe a couple of hundred people, and of those, there was only really a few dozen that were engaged in the community like in that was back in telegram before discord yep. so yeah i was actually talking about this in upland general last night where um now people are starting to get a bit burnt out with city releases like we just had rio drop and it's an expansion and an expansion that sort of thing it reminds me very much of the point in san francisco where uh, the team put it out there that i, I believe they wanted san francisco to be 50 percent minted out before they were going to open up manhattan and there was a series of minting challenges. Like one week it was like, okay, the, it's a minting challenge to mint in this neighborhood and whoever got the best stats, you know, there was there was prizes of Spark. Even though we didn't have Spark, it was building up your your Spark balance in the background. There was, you know, of course, Upex and that sort of thing. So, And that was just relentless. It was like, it was like they was kept squeezing us and they're like, please give us a break. That's too much. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. So... I, I do think that gamification of sorts with like minting or whatever it does get it does has helped the community you know get involved more I, I I do think that has improved the game like the enjoyability of just playing the game when they have some of these activities I think they've done really well I, yep, I mean what, what what are your thoughts there. Yeah, you know, when I started, there was no such thing as treasure treasure hunting at the very beginning. And there was really, there was, and 
there was nothing. And one of the first wines I ever did in Telegram was like, you guys need to get a, a game developer in on, in on your team because there's so many aspects of this that could be, you know, have slight gamification tweaks to really yeah. engage your audience more. Because I, I, at that point, I came from a, um, a game development. Uh, I was playing around with hobby game development for several years. So, yeah, there's, you look around, there's just so many little tweaks that could be made. And, you know, we'd offer up suggestions and this, that, and the other thing. But then, yeah, Treasure Hunting came on board. And really, the back in those days, the only gamification element was the community, like talking about things on Telegram. You know, we were discussing areas. Like I said, you, we were scrolling the map, pen and paper, and taking notes and talking about these things within Telegram and that sort of thing. So it, from the very start, the, the community was the main gamification element yeah. of it. Yeah, just networking and Telegram and talking about fun ideas. That's that's interesting. Yeah, so I was definitely not around for those days. It's interesting to hear more of your perspective on that. Um, what do you think gave Upland more momentum in those early days? Because you were, like, obviously one of the first people, like, in, in the grand scheme of things, you were, you were extremely early. Um, do you think like new cities is what brought a lot of people into the game? Do you think it's adding treasure hunting? Like what, what do you think really like took Upland to the next level from those early days of being pretty small to now over like 200,000 monthly players? Yeah, I don't know. Well, I'll just go back to a point you made where I was really early in the game, but I say this all the time. When I joined, I looked around the map and I was clicking on people's avatars and I just couldn't fathom that were, that there were people that had accounts that were worth 1 million UPEX or 3 million UPEX. That was just blowing my mind. This is like a mobile game. What are you talking about? Somebody spent somebody spent 3,000 actual dollars and I remember asking in Telegram, did I just miss out on some like massive giveaway or something? I just yeah. couldn't comprehend it. Um, so, yeah, yeah. If you, if you had to tell me back then that my account would be, you know, on paper valued what it is now i'd just think you're just absolutely mental so but as as far as as far as um how it kind of snowballed I, I don't really know to be honest i think a lot of people have come in through the brave browser campaigns or various yeah. facebook campaigns and then we've seen TikTok and this that and the other thing um i talked about this recently where i don't ever see anything upper land related in australia i don't know if that's because it's it's geo targeted or whatnot like i play a lot of uh, mobile, um, what do you call them, idle clicker games and that sort of thing. Yeah. And those are, I'm forever watching ads on those things. And I've never once seen an ad for Upland. But I know talking to more cheese and other people, they often see them. So, Yeah, I see them quite a bit on Brave, definitely. Mm. And that's, Is that's that how you little... yourself came in? Maybe you I was actually introduced um, by um, an employee, actually, like who... Mm who got a job there and just like we just both looked into the like, it was actually when he was first being interviewed for the job we were just friends and and he talked about dude look at this game and like that's really the only way i i got into it um was just like him w when we both researched it when he was looking at getting a job there and then I just started playing it. He ended up getting a job, so he can't actually play the game. And I just kept playing it. Like it, I, like you, I was just hooked really fast. Like, yeah. this is really cool, and you can actually see. But and and I'm curious to ask you. Like I approached it very very early on. Like it was sold to me as like, you can make money playing this game because I love strategy games. I, and and you know I I grew up playing a lot of a lot of video games. Um, but this idea of mixing like entrepreneurship and making money with gaming is what really like is extremely captivating to me. And I'm curious for you, was there this like money making aspect that was like compelling to you or did you just like the idea of the game er early on? Yeah, well, like I said, I, I had a background in game development. I, mm -hmm. I also had a background in forming communities like fan based communities around mobile games okay um and i was uh i know i still am a mad fiend for kind of idle clicker games and that's especially in the early days that's what 
upland was. There was nothing really to do. You mint a few properties, yep. you sit around, you collect your divs, um, that sort of thing. So, yeah, I definitely come from a completely different mindset where even now it's because it's just it's monopoly money essentially. Like I haven't taken out, I've taken out a hundred US dollars, and that was purely to it, there was um, a GoFundMe that was going on. So that's the only money that I've taken out. Um, for me, it's one hundred percent a game, um, and it's this is my hobby essentially. I know a lot of people they work very hard to pull out their investment. For me, it's never been, it's never had any investment. Um, side to it at all it's purely a a hobby um in a form of entertainment that sort of thing so yeah yeah so i'm curious if it if upland continues to grow into this massive like let's just say three years four years down the road it's it's by far clearly the number one metaverse and there is a lot of people like living full-time playing this game is that something that interests you like to be involved in like taking money out and like and making a full-time thing like like let's say it really becomes massive and and i mean the what you're holding right now is worth you know possibly like hundreds of thousands if not a million dollars in in the future is that something you would take seriously and play like as a career or or is that just crazy to you Uh, it's a bit of both like um and it's, it's a funny situation. Like back in the day, I always used to joke like perhaps this will get to the point where I can pay off my in real life mortgage with my yeah. my blue squares, you know, which just seemed it, – it seemed crazy to think about. But now I think my account, like the mint value or whatever you want to call it, the base net, net worth of my account is about 145 million UPEX. So that's, that's getting close to 200,000 Australian dollars. Yeah, but that that's that's not what I could sell it for because having been in the game for so long, you know, I do have a lot of you know um, sought after property, so you could probably push that out even if I was to go to really reserved. You're probably talking maybe two fifty three hundred thousand Australian dollars. That's getting to the point where I could like legit pay off my in real life mortgage. Yeah, so yeah, it's, it's crazy to think. It's a crazy situation. Um, there's a couple of caveats there. The biggest one being that for taxation reasons, we still don't know in Australia how the whole NFT situation is going to play out. I mean, the Australian tax department is still kind of getting their head around um, crypto, the crypto space. And I had a whole bunch of drama with crypto tax way back in the day. So when Upland first introduced the idea of the US out system, the US dollar out system, I actually won a place in one of the competitions. I won a place in the very first better. And I gave away my position because I like I'm, I don't want to touch that. I don't want to go anywhere near that. It's just like wow. a massive red flag for me at the time. So, um, yeah, I. And it's also a strange one where this is my this is my hobby. This is my entertainment. I'm very wary that if I make this my job, then I've kind of lost my hobby and my entertainment. Yeah, I don't want to get I in totally a position. Get that. Yeah, I don't want to get in a position where. And we've seen this with a few people um, recently who came into the space and they're trying to sell their properties and they're like, man, I've got to pay my rent. I've got to get groceries. I'm like, you know, it's not a situation I want to be in. And like I'm a father, yeah. I've got three kids. So it's, it's not something that I could take lightly. So I have been asked that question before and it's, it's not something that's on my radar at all, to be honest. Um, if we get to the point maybe five years down the track and – you know, it's, it's clear that I could take out a significant chunk and pay off the mortgage and do all that crazy stuff and cover all the tax, potential tax yeah. um, situation. Then I'd consider it. But I also don't want to destroy my account either, you know? Yeah, yeah. There, it's it's cool. Like there's some nostalgia in it, right? And everything you've gained and built up, definitely. Yeah. Like sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll show my wife, like I'll have a big sale come through or something, like something just recently sold in Manhattan and I'll, show on my account net worth and that and she's so funny she's just like yeah show me the money <laughs> you know it's it's Monopoly it's just money, numbers yeah. on a it's numbers on a game on your phone you know it's not that's not real so yeah yeah i get so, that who knows get maybe that. one day i'll be able to say told you so 
Yeah, and clearly, like people like Abdullah who've come in, and and yep. some of these big dogs who we know have invested a lot of money. Like clearly, there's a large group of people out there who see this as a as a, like investing in in crypto or investing in the stock market who are here for long term potential potential gains. But I do think it's important for all of us to remember it is a game. At its core, it's a game yep. that. Yes, in theory, you can sell stuff for USD and you can and you can get money out. And so, yeah, I, I think that aspect is actually really cool because you mentioned, you know, you, you've played a lot of mobile games and this idea of playing a game and making some money at it is definitely is definitely a little more enticing to me than just than just a game. Yeah, and a lot of the disconnect we see in many of these players that came into this with that kind of mindset, they're, they're coming from the crypto space and yep. they're used to things moving at high speed. You know, you know, I've been in crypto since mid-2017 and rode all the ICO pumps and all of that yep. sort of stuff. Um, people come in with that mentality, but I don't think that they get that Upland is a very, very slow burn. Like, and we've there's been numerous famous examples where people essentially rage quit because they they just can't get that this is a slow long term thing. Yeah. You know, it's it's like, been a source and, and of immense frustration. It's a stable economy, right? It's it's not it's not it's more like the real housing, like the actual housing market in the real world. It's not it's not doubling overnight or tripling overnight. There are cases where you can get lucky and you can like win a terminal for example or you can be someone who guessed an ultra rare property those are rare cases in upland where yes there are people who paid eight dollars for a property and then the next day sold it for two thousand or three thousand dollars right usd that 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 can happen as as you get lucky mostly and do your research maybe win some ultra rare properties and vanilla mode and then flip them so but i i that's always going to be a rare occasion i don't think there's people who can get ultra rare properties every city release i mean they're getting more and more competitive we just hit records with porto release of like over five thousand properties in a minute i mean that's just and only thirty five thousand properties total in the city the whole thing was gone in like an hour so it's crazy it's like back in the day when, um, like I said, when, when they wanted to open up Manhattan, they, they were pushing the community like crazy to get us to mint out 50%. So so they could start opening up in in bubbles, it was called. So they didn't open all of Manhattan at once. It was yeah. all of these little tiny bubbles. And it was interesting uh, on the Rio release, the first Rio release, I was... Uh, my tr- my tail was actually going through Coca Cabana, and I kind of just took some time to sit back and just observe what was happening. Like it was just so interesting to see just a wall of minting just going straight through the city. Like yeah. I, I grabbed a couple there, and then I jumped quite far north, and I kind of just sat there for a while and just watched just watched the wall getting closer and closer and closer. It was just it was really impressive to see, and I was like, "Holy crap! Look, look how far we've come!" And especially to have like no issues with jumping, no no lag, no crashes. You yeah, know? the performance is really yeah. because because you and I have been part of releases where it's you can't do anything. Like you oh try to mint something, and it's like it's buffering. You get the circle on the screen, and it lasts for two minutes, and you can't send that we got to give credit to the team the performance is truly incredible for how many people like five thousand in a minute is a lot of blockchain transactions and to have the game running smoothly is yeah that's a great point it's absolutely incredible i mean if if you're not aware if you're a listener and you're not aware of the backstory get on over to soundcloud and check out the nasty hooks they put a couple of songs together about the brooklyn burn um <laughs> kind of parody songs it's just hilarious like that was just the biggest dumpster fire we, we'd ever seen at that it point was. and especially for myself like um all of these releases are like crazy am time in australia so you imagine on a work night getting up at 1 am and then 
there's a they say oh sorry there's something happened we're going to open in another hour so you're like okay so you you sit up for another hour now it's 2 a.m and they go okay it's ready to go and then everything crashes and burns and they shut down and go into maintenance you got no idea when maintenance is going to end and, and i'm looking say, at oh we're going to do it tomorrow <laughs> yeah and i'm looking at the time thinking okay so it's i gotta get up in two hours there's no point in me going to bed now so that's a pretty rough day at work yeah. so but yeah the latest couple of releases rio porto i've you know this i've been whining about that for ages about the time zone but credit to the team as you say like i'll get up at 1 a.m i'll get what i want to get i'll get back on the train to get out of the city so i don't spend more than my budget and i'll be able to go straight back to sleep because it's yep. it's been completely smooth so i'm curious actually coming back to nodes a little bit have you is there are is, is you and your team kind of coming up with sometimes with these new city releases like okay we're gonna try to go after this neighborhood and you have a group of people like all just going in on maybe an out there obscure name maybe it's not a super highly sought after neighborhood and you guys can like get a group of people together to kind of mint like just go straight for that and not go for any of the collection properties at all is that has that been happening as well um yes and no um our whole thing within the udu as as again it's we are we are very different to what nodes are now so the the udu is essentially a collection of individual node projects working together so a node project is not a node project if it doesn't have a leader. If there's not somebody that's willing to take on, you know, that leadership role, and it's quite expensive to be the leader in a neighborhood node project, and especially because we have that 61% um, element, you know, there is flexibility. If if we know we're solid within the core members of the team, we can drop that to 51 or whatever like that. So there are conversations that we had. I did have, coming into Rio, I had a a 5 million upex balance that where we were thinking okay this is my upex balance for the first international city but that was purely not for me because i've already got enough projects on the go i i'm very aware and again looking back to my game development days i'm very aware of feature creep you know yeah if you're constantly chasing the next shiniest thing you never actually get anything done it's it's very easy to start projects but it's it takes a lot of time and a grind to finish them so Yes and no. The, the last neighborhood we pushed for was in the LA release. And that was okay. because Screw, he he had a plan there. He had a vision. He knew what he wanted. And it was essentially the team getting together to support him. Cool. Cool. I, I like that. So it's very strategic. It's not just every city release, we're going to go after it. We're going to make a node and go crazy with it. So there's... Yeah. There's patience involved. There's long-term vision with it, and not not moving too fast necessarily. But but that's that's based on the back of making a lot of mistakes. Yep. So when um, when Staten Island released, um, there was nobody within the team that wanted to push for a node themselves. So we thought, well, okay, well, why don't we come up with a community node where we encourage, you know a way for members of the, the wider public to get involved with what we were doing and that sort of thing. So we put a target out there and we pushed for it. But again, it became one of those situations where there was nobody within the team that was actually taking lead with that. So people would say, okay, we bought this property here now, now what? And we didn't really have an answer for them. So it got to the point where that kind of just fizzled and died. And I put it out there. I was like, look, if you were one of the people that got into this project and you bought your property there thinking it was going to be involved um I, i'm essentially at that point i was the sole leader of the udu so I, I had to say you know it's on me basically my my name's on the on the wall so i said you know if you want to bail out i'll buy it, i'll buy it off you for mint plus whatever costs were so yeah and, and we did similar in chicago and yeah it just became very clear through those kind of um, challenges that unless there's some leadership structure in place to fully run that it's just not going to work so okay wow that's a, lo a lot of great kind of history and that i think that's important for people to know because i agree with you like when i've started a project it it takes a lot of effort to actually build out a significant part of that i mean it takes getting people involved and 
invested in that same vision. Like it can't be done alone. Like you need a lot of spark. You need a lot of people building to work towards this vision and a lot of buy-in. And so, yeah, that's, that makes a lot of sense that there would be some that kind of just flop and maybe yeah, it raises the it floor a little bit and you just flip it and get out of there. Yeah. Yeah. But then it was really cool to see like, um, the Chicago re- release was when community wide open community projects kind of came into their, n- their own, like, um, Portage park is always the classic example. Like yep. I heard the chatter about Portage park early on and the most important thing for me is I could see that there was clear leadership and plans there. So I thought, all righty, this is something that could really go somewhere. So I went in pretty heavy there as part of my, my general um, push in Chicago. So, um, and that's, I think um, yourself, you have a community node and, you know, Mm -hmm. there's radish head. There's a whole bunch of people now that have these community nodes where it's, a lot more open to involvement and that sort of thing and it's more of a it's more of a general snowball effect yeah then yeah then then a driving leadership but you still need to have that aspect there somewhere yeah and we're not having we're not having leadership meetings or anything like that yet in any of the ones I'm involved with I and I did things like hey let's do a racetrack contest and I'll pay the winner to build a racetrack in Rego Park is one of the ones we did in Queens. And so, yeah, we're, I, I just feel like there's still a lot of information to come to, like what is the Upland team actually going to build as, you know, level one, like structure for organization of these neighborhoods. And maybe there's going to be like voting built in to the system. There's a lot of ideas that I think as a community we hope they'll bring and we hope it'll be like, but at the end of the day, it's we're, we are going to be kind of reliant on what structure they build as well for us to, yep. to work within, right? Yeah, absolutely. And we're forever telling, especially new members that join, like you need to be aware that we don't know where any of this is headed. Um, we're simply working with the information we have at hand. Like, from day one, the UDU is all about doing as much as we can with the information we have. So as new information comes on board, we're just pivoting. We're, we're not starting from scratch. And this this extends all the way to outdoor decor. And that's like yesterday, there was a whole bunch of stuff that kicked off with outdoor decor where because we were, because um, More Cheese, D-Tech and myself as our, our decor team, we're, we're doing as much as we can with the information we have as new information comes on board that can be very contradictory to the information we've received a week or two weeks ago. Um, yeah, it's, if, if you're not in that position where you're rolling with the punches, it can be a source of immense frustration for people. And there was a very classic example of that, that played out last night in the general chat and that sort of stuff, um, which is understandable. Um, but then I, it has been a source of frustration for myself as well, but I get where the team is coming from as well. This is this is all groundbreaking stuff. There's there's nobody doing this in the space. A lot yeah. of the stuff that they're doing is first time ever. So I, I think Upland has found themselves in a situation, especially like the very early roadmaps and that, where they put all these ideas for arcades and cafes and they've put all this out there. And like I say, it's very easy to say things and to put ideas out there but the reality of actually doing it is the biggest challenge i agree i agree and yeah um i'm curious what what level of like having it be blockchain technology is like is that a big part of why you're so passionate about upland like i'm i i get this i'm i'm kind of hearing that like you're you're busy with work you have family you have kids but and you're not necessarily playing this as like it could be it could make you money in the future but that's not your that's not what's driving you so what what does kind of motivate you to wake up early in the morning and get on these city releases and stay involved i'm just curious like what 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 is it about the whole thing that kind of kind of motivates you um now the main motivation is the community aspect like i've just met i've met some incredible people through that so that's the that's the main one now but yeah from from the 
from the actual start, it was definitely the blockchain aspect that that piqued my interest because you know I had been playing around with crypto um, for quite a while and quite deeply as my kind of again essentially a hobby sort of a thing. So if, if it had been just another monopoly type game, it's not something that I think I would have ever stuck with. Um, and if the community aspect of things didn't evolve the way they did, I I don't think I'd be playing the, the game as well. And that kind of extends even internally to you to you. Like um, myself and that other player, we came up with this concept. We started it all. Uh, there was other people that got involved, of course. And um, it's we've been through several very famous blow-ups that occurred internally with all sorts of drama. And then it was uh, Morchis who she really stepped up and took on a leadership role within the team. And through that, her and I kind of started to get to know each other better. And then we started all these other shows mm-hmm. and that sort of stuff. Um, now that's the main driving force. And there's there's a whole bunch of core members within the UDU team that I'm in constant DMs with on a personal level. You know, it's, it's not just... I mean, you, you are just an avatar out in cyberspace or whatever you want to call it. But through what is essentially now, I've been playing this game two and a half years, there's there's people that I've been talking to in the space for two and a half years. So yeah. it's it's that's the biggest part for me now is when I, when I wake up in the morning, like I get up at 3 a.m., I'm not opening the Upland game. I'm checking my DMs. Like th- there'll, be, there'll be times where like I'm in the mad scramble to actually go to my in real life job. And I'm like, oh crap, I haven't even opened the game yet. But I've been doing Upland related stuff for four hours in the morning leading wow. up to it. yeah wow yeah. so you are yeah that's impressive you definitely more than me like you're heavily involved like i i love creating content for it but you are heavily involved in this like networking aspect community making friends um yep. that's really cool that's really admirable that uh it's been kind of that kind of influence in your life a place where you have made some real life friends and uh that's that's i definitely see the value there and it's it's something that's fun and just keeps you going day to day yeah absolutely like like i said it's it's a source of entertainment it's a pressure relief valve it's challenging it's kind of all the things that you would want in a a hobby essentially like yeah um because i've got three young kids like Basically, from the time they get up until the time they go to bed, it's life is all about them and, you know, helping them to get ready and deal with life and after yep. school. And especially currently because my wife is working a lot of night shifts, so it's it's all on dad sort of thing. So yeah, um, I often, there's been plenty of times where I'm going to bed at the same time as the kids or sometimes even like on a Friday night or something, I'll say, okay, I'm going to bed. Um, just behave yourselves, be responsible, turn your stuff off. <laughs> brush your teeth and go to bed and they're they're really great kids so they're That's on board cool. with that too so yeah so it's it's definitely that the community aspect for me is by far the biggest thing up and above um any of the financial side of things like if upland as a game was to fold and collapse and nothing became of it that on paper that would be frustrating disappointing it's for me it, it wouldn't be like because I don't see it as an investment, it wouldn't be like, you know, oh my God, you know, I've wrecked myself or whatever. I, I, yeah. I would consider it a definitely a missed opportunity, but there's several of the friendships that I've made that I know would continue, can you continue on into some of the many other projects we've got going on and yeah. nothing would really change, you know? That's cool. So yeah. I'm curious uh, with, UDU and some of these other kind of entities that you've built on top of the game, are any of them actually like, have have you considered, or maybe they already are like real businesses that have like their own structure that way? Or for now, are they more just like community entities, uh, so to speak? Mostly community entities. Um, more cheese has a kind of different mentality in that respect where she deliberately targets um like mcdonald's and uh, there's a whole bunch of the in real life properties that she targets for a kind of long-term play 
Um, mm-hmm. She has met she has met people that are associated with these kind of well known businesses in real life. She's been out in the real world and met these people and started to have these conversations, or she'll email people and try and get them involved in that sort of stuff. So there is that's cool a partial aspect of that. But then I see people like um, Eddie from the Board Uplander Club, Buck. I see what he's doing as far as reaching out, like being proactive in reaching out to in real life businesses. And that's just, I find that just fascinating. The, the way he's working to onboard, you know, small businesses into the metaverse and that sort of thing. So for me personally, it's not something that I'm necessarily focused on at the moment. But yeah, I could definitely see it becoming a thing in future, especially as layer two and web three and all that kicks off. Yeah, it's going to be a massive kind of marketing opportunity for brands and way for them to connect in a different way than they've been able to in the past. And I think any any place that has a massive amount of entertainment, I mean, YouTube and anything like that, attracts a lot of brands to want to advertise there. So I think it's inevitable that brands will continue to get involved in the metaverse space and upland as they continue to grow so yep. that's yeah that's really smart i haven't been thinking about it that way necessarily of but yeah there will probably be people who come in who who create full-on marketing agencies out of uh, off of upland and the, and you get into decor shops hey we can custom build you know, logos for you that we can show on properties that can be marketing for you. I mean, that we're going to yep. get into more and more of stuff like that too. Yeah, well, that's essentially what Eddie's doing. He's boots on the ground, you know, knocking on doors and having conversations with people and saying, look, this is, I, I own your property in the metaverse um, and he will help them start their account. Because if, if you have no idea about this space, it's a hell of a lot to, wrap your mind around it is so he'll he'll help them on board he'll work with them to get them to the director status and he'll guide them through the process of applying for their their block explorer so it's custom to their brand and that yep. sort of thing so yeah absolutely I, I think there'll be more and more of that coming forward for sure yeah that's really cool mm. um so so there's people in your team that are kind of approaching it that way as well, well. that's that's eddie he's he's completely he's got his own project He's, okay. he's not associated with us. And it's, it's one of those things where from the very early days of UDU, we encourage people like get out there, join other projects, start your own projects. So most of our members are involved in so many other things like in leadership roles, in all sorts of stuff. They have their own projects external. It's, it's UDU has essentially become a, I don't know what the, the word is. It's almost like a uh, mothership sort of thing. You know, where people, they go off to their satellite projects, but there's always opportunities to come back and do what they want to do. That that has been a source of drama in some cases, but um, because we've been around for so long, most of that stuff has matured and those elements have been, you know, they've moved on to their own sort of situations. Yeah. So tell us, how do people get involved with UDU and some of these other projects you're working on if there's new players listening to this this podcast right now and they're they're intrigued with udu and what you're doing is it is it open for people to get involved is there applications how does it work for for new people to get involved yeah it's 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 a bit of both really i mean we don't actively recruit um that's kind of famous that you know we've been there we're like we've had the server wide open and we've just got every man and his dog involved and that just became a source of massive drama so there is a kind of roadblock and one of our very early members finsky um back in the day when we did open up to the wider public he was in my ear saying like this is not going to work out well we should be we should be um vetting people who we get in a lot more thoroughly and eventually i finally listened and took him took his advice on board so we do have a a vetting procedure so if if you go to udu.world there's there's a whole bunch of elements there. It has all our like team ethos, our you know our goals, our vision, all that sort of stuff, and it kind of outlines the the steps. But basically, it's just about reaching out. Like I've had people can send myself or more cheese or anybody with UDU tag on their name. Just send them a DM, and we'll point you in the right direction. And basically, we just ask you a few simple questions. You know, what's your in-game name? 
um, how old are you? Because there's that whole terms of service thing where you, have, you should be 18 years and above. Um, what's your EOS account? You know, the link that you can get from the game. And then yeah. wh- whoever gets that information from the player, we send that off to our vetting team that's internal. And then they just dive into your blockchain history to, you know, check what's going on there. Um, there's been several occasions where something doesn't look right there's red flags in the blockchain data and you know we'll ask you can you explain this what's happened here and most of the times it's just some there's been a a background deal gone on or you know there's there was some bonehead move that they've made and people have people have screenshotted the emails that they've sorted it out with the upland team and that sort of stuff yeah or probably the biggest one for us is the community history so we the vetting team will dive into your community history. Like I said, we've got members in all of the various projects. So we'll have a look for your username and just get a general vibe of who you are and what you're about. Like, because we've been through so much drama in the past, if, if you're someone who it's very clear in your community posting history that you're um, very much in the financial investment side, well, that's not necessarily going to vibe with our very slow long-term vision as a team so yeah that makes sense so there's a yeah. there's a very clear vetting process to make sure you're not getting involved with someone who has just their own interests or their own like personal agenda or trying to take advantage of you, you, you want to yeah. make sure they're going to be a good fit for the vision you're actually building with you to you and that goes both ways like it's 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 new members are vetting us as much as they're as we are vetting them because it's yeah. that there, there are so many communities out there. Like I said, we, we're not to everyone's taste. Um, we, we don't try to be, you know, that sort of thing. There's plenty of other projects that you can get involved in. And even when you do pass vetting, um, you get invited into our server. Most of the server is open up to you then, except for the node specific channels. Um, and you kind of have that role, get to know the team with for a month. And then after that month, we'll have a conversation with you. You know, do you actually want to get further involved or do you want to bail out, that sort of thing? Um, yeah, if we have members who join and then you don't see a single post for them for the month, well, you're not necessarily yeah. engaged. And that's that's fair enough. That's, you know, that's just not what we're about sort of thing, you know? Cool. So I guess there you have it. If anyone anyone's out there listening, you want to get involved, you like what UDU is about, uh, reach out and see if you you can get involved there. I mean, I mean yeah. that's S- send more cheese. I'm not getting you too many spam messages though. Huh? <laughs> send them to more cheese. She loves the random. Yeah, things. reach out to more cheese and she'll She's she'll vet me. you and see see what you're about. <laughs> that's cool. Yeah, yeah. So now we we are we are open, but we're but we're not. If that makes sense, sort of thing. Okay. Very cool. Yep. Yeah, I'm curious. Is there is there anywhere else you'd want us to like go towards with the inter- with the and anything else you want to share or promote specifically or uh, what where where what can we jump into? Well, our biggest thing at the moment, and like speaking of engagement again, I've been very slack within the team myself. You know, because I only have a limited amount of time that I can focus on all of these different projects that we got going on. So. At the moment, for me, it's all about getting ready for outdoor decor to release. So, um, yeah, that's Samurai Aquatics and Decor. And we just recently opened up our server to the wider public to get involved there. And, you know, we're going to run, I think there's a competition going in there at the moment that you could win 10,000 Apex. We're going to do a whole bunch of different things like that. So check that out. There's there's plenty of information there in the, what is it, the community projects thing in Upland General. We're always posting in there. Or again, just reach out. Someone will point you in the right direction. So that's what we what we got going on there. And then, of course, Cheese and myself, um, we started the Metaverse Ventures Entertainment kind of brand as far as all the show productions and that sort of stuff we got yeah. going on. So, yeah, there's, there's plenty of stuff for us to do. But like I said, there's only so many plates that we can spin at once. And that that's something that I've really focused on the, the last six months too is... <sighs> I, I see a lot of people, again, start all these projects and you're spinning all these plates everywhere, but you can only focus on so many at once. So I've started to detach myself a little bit from a few things and just focus on what I can focus on at the moment. And like I said, at the moment, it's probably I'm 
110% invested in trying to get the outdoor decor up and running. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. So what it, you were in like the the original beta group approved for the outdoor decor shops, right? Yeah, and we have had as Upland has released information about outdoor decor, there's been people in the community say, "Okay, how can I apply?" and then someone will say, "Oh, well, applications are closed." And people will say, well, that's unfair. These these 10 people, it's all a monopoly, blah, blah, blah. A lot, what a lot of people don't realise is if I look at the timeline, um, so I applied for, I applied on the 15th of January 2021 for the <laughs> Upland Better Business Program. And my business application was accepted on the 9th of February 2021. So since the 9th of February 2021, we have been waiting for this. <laughs> for these outdoor decor shops yeah yes so and, and honestly probably based on the history of some of these because i i was involved in one of the first uh nflpa legit shops that's the one i got involved with um and we've had block explorer shops that came first so i definitely think for those of you out, out there, if you feel gypped for whatever reason or like there are people who've had applications in fair and square who submitted them and were approved. So it's and and we have seen, though, how quickly uh, the Upland team will release it to the public. So yep. it's not it it's not even going to be a massive advantage for you. And I can tell you as a, a shop owner that like it's. It's honestly a lot of learning up front. There's a lot of management. It's oh, yeah. not all fun and games, and it's not all just money making opportunity. It it takes a lot of takes a lot of work to manage these, and without with with these decor shops, you're actually having to work with designers and creating designs yourself. Yep. So that's that's going to be interesting. I I know that Dirk recently mentioned with cars. I'm not sure if you read his uh, response to like Mark Cuban's yep. thing, but one thing he said in there that I thought was really keen is like there could be a type of rev share model. I'm not sure if you caught that, but a rev share model where people like us could be manufacturing cars for real world brands. Like let's say Lexus or Audi or Honda or whatever. Yep. And they, they have digital cars in the game there's going to be opportunities for players to actually be creating those cars but there's a there's probably a fee tied to like the creation of it that is a kickback to the brand who who owns that that content so that to me is really interesting as well so i'm curious with outdoor decor if there's going to be some branding some brands as well that will have that like that they're a lot of outdoor decor shops I know are going to be like 100% custom built stuff by by people, but I think there's also going to be like maybe some generic branded stuff that people will be able to have a factory be creating and selling some of this stuff, even if they're not designers. So I think I think there will be both sides probably. Well, there's a lot to unpack there, really. I mean, we've had those conversations internally. Um, for quite a while now um, people that feel like they've they've missed the boat you, you haven't missed the boat at all like like you said with these shops and I mentioned earlier like the information we got to light yesterday kind of threw a massive spanner in our works for outdoor decor but we are we are essentially going through all of these teething problems when it releases we're going to be the ones that have to deal with all the drama and getting things streamlined Yep. If you're going to come on later, you you get the benefit of not having to deal with all of that, the time, the frustration, the cost, and that sort of thing. So you have not missed the ball at all. And more cheese is always banging on about, like, if you're someone who wants to get involved in outdoor decor, don't wait for the team to say applications are open for the extension of outdoor decor. You should be working flat out now. Build your team. Get your stuff ready. Get Even, designers, yeah. too. Start actually yep. designing things that yep. you want to want to build because yeah it'll it'll happen really fast and it yep. i think there will be a point where it gets somewhat saturated it uh, will. i yep. think i think ev like with the economy there's going to be auto balancing things where like yeah i was lucky to be one of the first nflpa shops but now 
Uh, there's a ton more applications out there and people. But I think we're going to see probably a point where there's too many and then it kind of balances itself back out. And so yeah. regardless, with these outdoor decor shops, it's really cool because of the cust- customization you yeah. can have. And that's where that's a great point to make. Like if, if you are out there interested in building decor items or even working with brands and having items for them that they can, like for you mentioned McDonald's. If you want to build these golden arches, you know, McDonald's, M's yep. everywhere in the metaverse, like for to to work with McDonald's to promote it. Start building those now, so that when the time comes, you can. I think everyone who wants a, who's die hard on getting a shop will be able to get one eventually Absolutely. if they're committed to it. Like I don't think it's gonna be this uh, exclusive group that only gets access to it. I th- I I really don't see it that way long term. Well, mainstream's a blessing and a curse, isn't it? I mean. Yep. While when the outdoor decor releases, there will be, well, there was originally ten outdoor decor better business participants. I know a couple of those have dropped off; they're just not engaged in the game at all. Yep. I know there's a couple who, even though we've had over a year and a half to prepare for this, they're not prepared at all. Once the stores open, they may have one item listed for sale; they may have nothing prepared. Yeah. Um, so it will look like very much like it's a monopoly situation but just like what happened with block explorer shops i think as soon as they've worked out the bugs they'll open it up a little bit wider and then once that once that goes through and they see how that works and then they'll just open it like like now we've just had nflpa shops and block explorer shops that application process is is essentially now wide open with no expiry date Um, i think exactly the same thing will happen with decor now Decor is a little bit different, as you touched on, as far as um, global brands being getting involved. We've had conversations internally where um, I'll use IKEA because that's just a general name that everyone knows. So yeah. I can very um, easily see a situation where Upland signs a deal with IKEA for outdoor decor. And just like the Metamotors and just like um, Porto and all of these other partnerships, they will essentially run their own outdoor decor with, you know, massive funding behind them, massive support from the team. Um, stores like our Samurai Aquatics one, we will essentially become, um, like you say, customized uh, niche kind of areas. There, there's always going to be people who have special interests, especially when you talk about node groups. Like um, I always use Portage Park as an example because that's a very known massive yeah, wide one. Massive. Well, there's 14,000 properties in Portage Park. If you wanted to make a, I don't know, a red and white letterbox, well, you've potentially got 14,000 customers that that you can do a custom build for. So yep. there will be niche market opportunities. Um, you, you can't have the mindset like, oh, it's not fair, IKEA is getting involved. Again, that's just, I'm putting that out there just you know, it's not, yeah. not saying that IKEA is involved, but you, you can't have the mindset. Spirit where, Halloween. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That they're, they're taking money out of my account. It can't be. It's it's a. It, they're trying to be an open capitalist community. Well, that's a massive part of it. You know, it's it's always. Don't worry about what you haven't got. Focus on what you have got and what yeah. you can do. Yeah. Yeah, I I have noticed a lot of that kind of. Even when when you talked about earlier, there there is a lot of that mentality within the community that I've noticed spreading around, and I think that's kind of like a disease. We got to get away from like thinking, yeah. oh, I I didn't get in early enough. In my opinion, everyone here is still extremely early. If we actually yes. grow into the potential here, like you could get, you could join probably months from now and still be way early. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, as well as yeah thinking you got you missed out or you're you got gypped on something like everything is i i think upland two years from now will probably not even be recognizable of of what it is today like the, yeah especially if the layer two if yeah, some layer of the two. ideas that are kicking off with that if if they come to fruition yeah absolutely yeah um, and i think a, a large majority of the players don't even understand this whole concept of layer one versus layer two like it's probably only those who've really studied and thought about what 
Dirk and Idan and the team are actually saying about these third party development uh, yep. tools and, and where it could actually lead like games within the game games built on the game um, the Upland team does not want to th th that's I think a concept that needs to be understood the Upland team does not want to build everything for us and cr like it's just that like they've literally just given us the foundational core for all of us in the community and brands to come on and to create what whatever it is we want to create games entertainment um entrepreneurship uh it it the other big thing i think that's important for people to understand is that dirk mentioned is these four principles of of an economy of land labor capital and entrepreneurship yep. and that a lot of these other metaverses don't give all of that it's like only for brands or and whereas upland is saying anybody can come in create a shop and have user generated content like customized content being sold out out of a factory yep. that if you can create value just like anyone who wants to start a business in the real world you have to find something valuable that you can sell and convince people that this is a cool thing to purchase and so it's it's the same yeah. thing of capitalism and entrepreneurship i, I think that people it's should kind see of it a, as it's a bit of a catch-22 situation and we started thinking about it based you know on the back of that whole mark cuban situation where he's talking about how the land is you know it's worthless essentially like it got us thinking and one of the one of the things that has always been spruiked about upland is that it's it's not a it's not an imaginary land sale. You're buying in real world addresses. So there is a limited supply there. And I don't know if it was on the UDU podcast or the one in Chi show where we, we said, hang on a minute. Well, actually how many cities are there in the world? And it turns out there's about 10,000 cities in the world. So not, not all those are going to be mapped to the, the extreme that can be used in Upland. But if there's 10,000 10, cities in the world and they release one a month, that's 830 something years worth of property so that that whole mentality that there's a finite supply of land within upland that that needs to come out of the equation because there really isn't like and we've seen this with rio the rio expansions and porto and upland has made it very clear from the very early days so that that they want localized communities localized economies and i think a lot of what we're seeing is really pushing in that direction and like i said back Back in the San Francisco days, we were burnt out with minting challenges. Now, what we're seeing in the community now is a lot of people are getting upset. They're getting burnt out with these constant city releases. Um, I, I've kind of fallen in that trap myself where I'm like, what, Rio again? Are you serious? But it kind of makes sense where they're, they're trying to – you can't do everything all the time. And I've seen this within myself, within the UDU team. And like you mentioned about pushing for new nodes and that sort of stuff, we're not constantly looking for new things. We're, we're coming back to our core foundations and we're thinking, yep. okay, how can we build that up? And then once layer two gets involved, then that's, that's going to expand on that further. So, yeah, I, th I think it's catch 22 where, yeah, they, they got to push, they got to push all of these releases to get the supply out there for new players. Yeah, you kind of got to. People don't see that the the main focus is about local localized economies. That's a pretty good way to do it. Is imagine if they released okay uh, next month we're going to release five cities. Yep. You know, five cities all at once. He here's a hundred thousand properties. Well, people are going to say, oh, the supply and demand's way off. The economy is all whacked out. But what it will get you to do is, you know, if you're going to stick with the game, is you're going to think about okay, what have I got back? going on what am i actually yeah. interested in so it's kind of a it's kind of a precarious balance at the moment i think yep you got to get strategic about it and i do th i, I love to like our discussion earlier about all of these entrepreneurial opportunities like it's not all a lot, a lot of people love getting stuck on what the game is now right yes. and like okay, well, you have to get collections and you like the only way to really make money is flipping collections and it's cheap because all these big dogs get all like, it's like, 
there is so much. There is probably someone who could start today with an idea like that of, okay, I know a lot of automotive shops, like I or or they have a background in whatever, like they know any real world brand out there. Like let's say golf courses. Like I yep. love to play golf, and I actually want to develop a, a golf mini game. You could start going out in Upland and acquiring all the. Go do go do research of all the cities that have been released and acquire the golf courses, and it's yep. where real world golf courses are. And now you can go and you could maybe in the future create a mini game that's only accessed through like going to those golf courses in the game. And that's where I really think Upland is really powerful because it's the real world. If you yep. use if you blend real world and virtual world, I think is actually going to be a huge key component for success for a lot of people out there. Uh, and that's where I, I really look up to these people who are like, I'm buying all the McDonald's and then I'm going to yep. try to get a freaking deal with McDonald's in the real world. Like that is just very different approach than just collections and what the game pitches itself ads like there's there's a lot of this other opportunity and that's that's really cool yeah absolutely and w we've seen numerous examples of that and it kind of goes back to the the point where we we kind of let go of the no terminology and set it free in the community you know make of it what you will make it your own do yep. whatever you want with it and i think um elijah from the real node la is a classic example of that like if you if you look at what he's got going on in la on paper as far as back in the day, it's, it wouldn't be considered a node at all because it's just a one area within one neighborhood. But if you look at the ideas that he has and the plans he's got in place and the connections he's making, yeah, that's absolutely a node and it's incredible. And that's just somebody new that's come into the game. He's seen what it's about. He's had a vision and he's putting in the time. He's putting in the effort. And same with um, the Board Uplander Club, Bark. It's, it's, yep. it, it really is that mindset where... People are coming in thinking, not what can I get out of this, it's what can I contribute to this. Of course, there is a – nobody wants to lose money. So there is an aspect of that, but it's – the people that I see that are the most successful is that's not the main focus at all yet. Yeah. Maybe that is in the background, but it's 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 not the driving force. And yep. um, going back to one of your earlier points, I think what's most impressive to me about the Upland team is just – how relentless they are in seeing their vision through like i've been a a very big mouthed whiner all through the history and it's it's been very interesting to see how especially i think this latest um bear market with the crypto like there, there was so much pushback in the day this this should be on an exchange blah 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 and then we've seen how stable the economy is and then people go well Thanks for not listening to me when I was yeah. you know, whining like a beast. So I think there's numerous examples where um, if you look at it from a big picture perspective at what they're trying to achieve and do, you, you got to admire how, like I say, relentless they are in seeing their vision through. Um, yeah, in the short term, that can be frustrating, especially, like I said, in the early white papers and that, you know, talking about cafes and this, that, and the other thing. I think it's good that they've kind of really – it's basically um, saying less and delivering more. It's yeah, that sort of thing. Yeah, I agree, and I I I think it's not necessary for them some because of how grand their vision is. That, like you've said, with your own projects, you have to go back to the core of what you what you want to build, not get carried away with all the things you can. And I yep. think Upland has been able, the team has been able to stay focused not get carried away just just making what all the community is whining about for them to build and we also have to realize like just the voices on discord like i don't know how many people there are 20 it's 20 or 30,000 yeah and then how many of those are actually active like we're probably talking like 10% or less of the community is actually active on Discord and there is a bunch of people who are just satisfied logging into the game, playing, probably never going on Discord, yep. not even watching a lot of content about it. Like and the Upland team is 
committed to, I think, that whatever their long-term vision is. And I agree with you. I think they've stayed focused. And uh, especially this last Genesis week, I think, brought us way more than we even fathomed they would. Yeah. Um, and some people may not, some people probably weren't impressed. But again, if you understand, I think, the potential implications of these third-party development tools they talked about, I think it's, I think it's massive. Yeah, and obviously when, when we have these announcements like um, they've signed a deal with the Porto football team and that sort of thing, that, those are obviously conversations that have been happening in the background for several months. You yep. you know that the Upland team has, there's, they're probably having right now, they're probably having dozens and dozens of similar conversations and there, there, there will be things in the community that people are whining about, complaining about and Upland could, they have the information. They could say, "Well, actually, we've got all that covered," but they're not in the they're not at the point where they can divulge that information yet. So, yep. imagine that must be like I think of somebody like X One who may have all that background knowledge, and he would like to say what it is. It'd be but frustrating. You, you just can't. So, um, yeah, hard what, position. What's your What's your take on like you say about the active community? One of the biggest um, eye openers for me was when they opened up the the um, nominate your nominate your residents for your neighborhood. Um, it was a bit surprising for me to see how low the numbers were. I think the last time I checked, there was really only two, 3,000 people had done that. Have even um, selected an address? Wow. Yeah. So, And you're talking about, what is it, two, 300,000 monthly active users or something? So it's, it's a fraction of the community that is like as crazily engaged as as we are who do these shows who listen to these shows um i know from within the udu team there's a significant percentage of those who come from the crypto space and who are not keen on the whole kyc aspect and yeah that's that's a tricky one um that was like i said that was pretty eye-opening for me like how how small the actual engaged community is Exactly. And e- even what percentage of players actually own a building? I think these micro, yeah. the micro houses were cool. Show homes, we call them. Yeah. So w- with these micro ones, there's a little bit less barriers to entry. I think some we'll start seeing some small players with just very little spark be able to finish one in the next month or so and be yeah. able to actually declare, declare a, a residence. But I think until... Again, more utility actually comes around, like more features with actually having a residence. I think it won't be. Right now, it's like why? Why does it matter? Because pe- yeah. people don't people. You the game hasn't created a reason for people to care about declaring a residence yet. The but communities care. Those of us who are in nodes, I think, see the vision and are are doing it. But I I I kind of ask myself like. So I've personally actually introduced quite a few friends and family. Like my dad plays, my stepdad plays, both my brothers play, and v- very different levels of interest in in the game. Some of them log in once every two months and just see what's going on, and some of them are in all the city releases, and then some of them are calling me like every week, like, "Hey, what do we do with this?" You know, and it's. And I think you do have that, but I think at least all of them are still bought into the long-term vision of Upland, even if there some of them are only logging in once a month right now. So I, there's probably a large majority of people out there who are, like you said, come from a crypto background. Maybe they've dabbled in like every project that's been intriguing to them. So maybe they came in and purchased, you know, a hundred properties and in that some cities they think that are cool and now they're just going to kind of wait and see okay let's see what upland actually does you know and yep. then i'll get back in and see what i want to do with that so I, there's probably a lot of people like that too um but I, I i wish i kind of had an actual numbers of you know what w- you could actually like pie chart that out of what mm. what people are actually th- i'd be curious if they did a poll or something yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the things that has been a bit of a source of frustration as far as, you know, having a building and being able to have utility with it, we had 
I think it might have been even the first October and may have been October 2020. We had in-home experiences way back then. And since then, nothing has been done with that, which is, yeah, I'm pretty sure that was before we could actually build anything. Like um, they put a thing out there for Halloween, um, create a video, uh, create a short video. And several of us in the community created these funny little Halloween themed video. Like I, my kids and I put this script together. We recorded this kind of funny little thing. And Upland essentially airdropped a Halloween house, a Halloween themed house on one of your nominated properties. And there was several of them in San Francisco and they did a tour. Like you could hop to that address and you click on the, there was like a play button and you enter the house and you press play to watch a video within the house. You Really? You watch, I yeah, did not watch, even know about this. Yeah, there's so many people don't even know about it. And like we had that experience. Like there was people back in the day that um, put massive time and energy into productions like the Nasty Hooks who I mentioned before and Sturz Merlin, an OG player. The yep. production quality that they did for their video was just mind-blowing. I just loved it. Um, wow. So we had that way back when. So and, it was a video that actually popped up on the app like like yep or it took you to the website or it actually played in the game no because i'm 100 percent mobile i don't go on the web for anything unless it's spark registration or anything like yeah. that so yeah it's you had imagine the map as it is now but there was no houses except for in I, there may have been i don't know maybe 10 players who submitted a video so there wow. was li- these little halloween houses and like what we see with the nfl pa shops and that where there's a an orange dot I yeah. think it was might have been purple or something like that. So yeah, you you scrolled in, you sent to the property address just like you have to do with anything. Yeah. And then there was there was a button you press to enter the building and you go in and you see there was like a Halloween background to the house and then you press play, you could watch the video wow. and that sort of thing. So that was way back when. So So this was and, all this was just San Francisco days. Yep. Wow. Yeah. Well, I I don't know if if Manhattan was open at the time, it probably wasn't. I don't know. I'm shocking for dates, but yeah, that that's yeah. we did see that last Christmas. They did the same thing. They put it out there for videos, and I thought, oh, here we go again. They're going to do something with it. But again, a bunch of us submitted videos, but they ended up pulling the pin. I don't know why they pulled the pin on that. I don't know whether it was they ran out of time or the the mechanics of it weren't going to work or something like that. But, yeah, yeah. But I do think that idea alone shows some again future potential like yep. cool features that people i mean you could have movie theaters that play movies and you could buy yep. a ticket to like i this there's thousands of ideas you know but well, it's, yeah. it's cool to think about all of those ideas were floating around like you had people like left house was making productions he had productions that he was ready to go there was musicians looking to get involved various artists this that and the other thing and we we're waiting 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 i think um it may be the case now where, as you said, Upland's not, they're not focused on that. Maybe that'll be pushed to a layer two thing. And we've seen this with yeah. the some of the stuff that Upex, the Upex World team has put out now. It's kind of heading in that direction. Like, yep. yeah, way back in the day, we, we wanted to see a situation where we could have an essentially an NFT art gallery within one of our properties. Like you should be able to enter these things. Like an apartment building has whatever it is. Is it eight? Eight? eight different levels in the apartment building yep. within the game you, you you know you should be able to enter that building and like level one is your whatever nfts and that sort of thing so i think that's coming i just don't think it's like you said i don't think that's going to come from directly from the team and that, that's yeah it's an interesting prospect like when thank me later put this information out about layer two i asked is there going to be a mobile option and he said, yeah, that's something they're going to look into, but that's, that's not the driving force. It is it is a lot of the, it's a, I'm not speaking specifically about that project, but it's, it's that kind of vibe where it, it's a companion website, but yep. I don't use the website. I never use the website. So unless it's a companion app on the phone, I'm as, as engaged as I am in the game, if, unless it's a companion app on the phone, I, I won't be getting involved. I can't get involved. Yeah, so. I, I agree. I think, it's gonna be it's gonna be interesting what happens with layer two. I again I think it's gonna be another one of those things where we see a lot of saturation. We see a lot of like bunch of people building really random stuff. That's like okay, why do 
I mean, from a gaming aspect, people that build games on top of it, I think will be fun just because of like the nostalgia you have with the game to play, uh, you know, uh, like Battleship, for example, using properties like layout or whatever, like uh, checkers or whatever. Like you could see interesting things be built that is is fun for tower defense is one is an idea that we've talked about that would be really cool tower defense games um but yeah a lot of that i don't know how that's i agree with you i think layer one is still going to be like the most compelling for for a while to just yeah stay in and so yeah well it's... I'm, I'm a i'm an ex hobby game developer i have dozens of little game projects i'd love to be able to port those into the game and you know you pay whatever it is you two upex or some some ridiculously small price to to pay it like i made a lot of um addictive twitch shooters and this that and the other thing where it's like that you only get one life okay i'll try again try again yeah if if you made it one upex you know you, you you're not trying to gouge the community but something like yeah. that would be awesome if i could do that but if if it can't be done on mobile I'm not going to work on something that my, myself can't, can't do, you know? Exactly. It's kind of a tricky situation. Yeah, and I thought that would be really cool if there's, like, leaderboards in there and maybe even yep. you can win a little bit of Apex if, you, if you're, if you like, the one of the leaders for the week or whatever. I, I, I do think there will be cool... Uh, the idea to make money gaming is, is also really cool. Like, if you're... Like right now, the way gamers make money is they're like Twitch streamers, right? And they get a big following and there's esports behind it. But the idea of just being able to make a little bit of money just playing the game, the mini games in there would be would be pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely. So that's a that's a fun that's a fun thought. Um, so is that something you studied in school? Is like, or is that was that just a hobby thing you got into? Is like designing some of these mini games or it's a funny story um i guess we can go way back i i was a grade 10 high school dropout like from the moment i ended high school i just didn't want to be there but I, i'd been working since i was 12 years old um in my stepdad's as part of his business like i used to wash dishes in the kitchen stand on a stool and wash dishes and i used to walk around and collect all the glasses for the bar and all this sort of thing yeah um so i i would I definitely got out of school as fast as I could because I just wanted to be in the workforce. So I worked full time from the age of 15. And then I had wow. a girlfriend at the time uh, and I was mad keen on aquariums as a hobby, like in my apartment, I forget how many fish tanks I had, but it was a lot like my weekends, I was cleaning fish tanks and dealing with all sorts of stuff. That's cool. And my girlfriend at the time said, you should make this your job. And I'm like, what, what are you talking about? And she said, well, there's, there's places that do this as a job, like um, aquaculture. And I was like, aquaculture? What the hell is that? So anyway, I looked into it, and I saw that there were several university degrees available for to learn how to be an aquaculturist. And I thought, university? How the hell am I going to go to university? I was a grade 10 dropout. And she kind of guided me through the process. So I did like a mini crash course. But I could apply as a mature age student. So I think I started university when I was 22 or something like that. So I ended up going to two different universities in different parts of Australia. Um, got qualified both undergrad and postgrad as an aquaculturist. Worked in two of the, or the two biggest, um, what we call prawn hatcheries. I think you call them shrimp, shrimp farms or whatever there. So working in the hatchery in a laboratory position like the last position that I had was a very biosecure lab. Like I was the only one allowed in that lab. So I just wow. crank music and play it all day sort of thing. So that's, that's where I started. And I was, I loved that job. It was awesome, but it was six months in the lab and six months on the farm. So prawn farm work is you're out in the sun all day, swimming in, ponds cleaning paddle wheels it's real kind of grunt work i wasn't real mad keen on that <laughs> so i i said to my boss at the time um um i'm thinking about going to japan on a working holiday visa and that that was something that i've been thinking about for several years and the working holiday visa is a situation where you essentially can go to another country and work for up to six months and there's cool. all sorts of um 
benefits associated with that. But the cutoff was 30 years old. So I was 29 years old and I was not really loving this six months on the farm. So I thought, bugger it, I'm going to go. So I left everything in Australia, like my apartment uh, with my sister. I said to my boss, I'll be back in six months. I moved to Japan, called my boss up, called my boss up pretty much after the six months. I was like, yeah, I'm not coming back. So got my one of my sisters to sell all my stuff in Australia, everything, fridge, car, all that sort of stuff. And got in Japan, was there for two years. One of the jobs I had in Japan was a, I got thrown in as a kindergarten teacher. Obviously, I had zero, zero skills, zero training. <laughs> here's, a, here's a room of 20 Japanese kids who don't speak English. Here you go, teach them English. Um, yeah. You can imagine what that's like, but some of the, some of the funnest times I've ever had in my life comes That's from cool. those stories. So during that time, I, I met my now wife, girlfriend, and we moved back to Australia together. After the two years in Japan, we moved back to Australia, got married, had one kid. Um, and then I just went back to grunt factory work, basically. And it's one of those things that I just, for whatever reason, I really missed that kindergarten job. So I looked into um, doing kindergarten work in Australia and, you know, I had to complete, um, I think you call it a, what do you call it? It's not university. What's the lower tier one? Community college. Yeah. 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 So I had to, I had to complete what is essentially a community college course to become a kindergarten teacher. So I did that, switched over to becoming a kindergarten teacher in Australia. We were in Australia for three years, but I didn't really get Japan out of my system. Like if, if, if I had a stayed in Japan, probably if I had a stayed for another year, I would have seen enough, done enough, experienced enough where I thought, yeah, that, that kind of chapter is closed. But because I was there for two years, from the moment we landed in Australia, I was constantly, my wife said, we need to go back, we need to go back, we need to go back. So I eventually talked her into it and we moved back to Japan and started our own business. And when we moved back, I, my wife was mad keen on getting an iPhone. I was dead set against it. I was like, dumb on an iPhone, <laughs> blah, 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 blah. And of course, as wives tend to do, she won that argument and I got myself an iPhone and I found um, Super Stickman Golf was a very early mobile okay. game. So I started playing that game. I created some communities about that game. You know, we did on- online tournaments. Uh, we're doing YouTube videos. Awesome. That sort of thing is a bit of fun. And it was through that. And my job in Japan was a lot of evening work. Like we ran our own English school. So I was working essentially 3 p.m. till 8 p.m. So I would have all day available. So it became a bit of a night hour while I was staying up, staying up watching YouTube videos crazy late and just basically wasting a whole heap of time. Yeah. And I thought, well, how can I make use of this time? And that's where the idea of playing around with making my own games came in. And again, zero coding background or anything like that so i started from scratch just making very simple prototypes this that and the other thing so it was definitely a hobby and i continued that for the four years that we're in japan um worked with various teams made a whole bunch of little hobby games and that sort of stuff and then moved back to australia and yada 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 ended up having to go back to university to for a whole bunch of different reasons so yeah it was the game development was never it was never a job. It was nothing I ever had experience in. It was just something yeah. that all of these kind of – it's a very long-winded answer. I apologize. But, it, yeah, it was all these little tiny steps that just kind of fell into each other. And it was through – it was actually through through the connections I made there, I first heard about Bitcoin and got interested in blockchain. And it's kind yeah. of one of those – butterfly effect things you know if you take any one piece of the puzzle out well we wouldn't be here having this conversation now god knows what i'll be doing yeah. <laughs> yeah serious yeah that well thank you for that answer i actually really like that gives me a lot of context as to like the type of uh person that you are like it's really cool that you uh just have these ideas and and run with it like something sounds intriguing and you you dabble in it you get into it like from yeah, the aquariums I, to like even just how impactful it was teaching English to these kids in Japan to 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 gaming and like okay I want to try developing like that's really admirable a lot of people 
live their life more in fear of like, oh, I don't know if I'd be good at that. But you're it seems like you're the type of person that just something intrigues you, you try it out and see where it goes. Well, that that's full credit to my father. Like he, I struggled as a bit of a kind of, I went right off the rails as a kind of 18, 19, 20 year old, like was into all sorts of dumb stuff that I shouldn't have been. Um, he pulled me aside one day and said, what are you doing, mate? You know, pull your head in. Um, and then I kind of come clean with a whole bunch of stuff. And he's like, look, mate, if, if you're in a situation where you're not happy, you are completely in control of your destiny. Just go and do something else. Yeah. And I took that advice on board that there was a period in time where every two years I would move somewhere completely different in Australia. Like I said, I, I went to two different universities, which were in completely wow. different parts of the country. Like Australia is a big country. Mm -hmm. um, and Australia is very much like America where you can move to a different state and it's almost like a different country. Exactly. Like it's different completely. food. It's, it's almost a different language. Um, different cultural things and that sort of stuff. So, yeah. so yeah. And even when I was working in the aquaculture industry, I, I moved from the very bottom of Australia. I moved to the top of Australia, lived there and that sort of thing. And yeah, I was very, if I was never happy in a situation, I would just say, well, okay, well, this is not working. I'll just go and pursue something else. And that was kind of also what led to me. If I hadn't have had that background experience in just, packing up everything. Like when I moved to Japan, I didn't know a single person. Um, I barely knew the language at all. Um, wow. had no context. You know, it was just, okay, I'm here. Now what? And you got to figure it out. Yeah. You know, it's challenging, but there's, there's so many rewarding things that can come from that. And like you say, I, I know several people who have never moved out of their hometown. I mean, there is value in that. Um, it's different ways you, that you can go about it. But I know there's people that look back on their life with a lot of regrets where yeah, I've just been wanting to say, Oh, what, what the hell? Let's try it. What, what's the worst could happen? You know, that's um, really cool. And led to a lot of cool experiences, obviously. So that's, Oh, absolutely. Definitely an admirable trait that I need to work on is get going more <laughs> with the flow and just, uh, trying things. That's something just for me, just being in, um, uh, creating YouTube videos, was like a yep. thing i was intimidated at first but that you just get comfortable and you just uh try it out and find out it's something that i really enjoy is just creating content and speak like sharing sharing some of my ideas with other people and getting feedback on it it's just been really fun and yeah i could have said well i'm not going to do that i'm not going to be good at that but just trying things out and it uh, has been has been really fun for for me to do so yeah, I can definitely relate to that. Like, um, we started publishing our UDU team meetings, like from the get go. We didn't have a clue what we were I remember doing. those very from funky, the beginning. Very yeah. awkward. Um, and then, like, the UDU almost imploded in on itself based on all the drama. And, like, like I mentioned, Morchi stepped up to the plate there. And through my um, the development of our friendship, you know, we came up with these ideas for different other shows and that sort of thing. Like, we do two shows a week. Um, and that's purely because it's entertaining and engaging to us. Like it's, it's fun yeah. if, you know, when we're not doing it for numbers, we're not doing it for income. It's if, if it ceased to be fun, well, we just simply wouldn't do it. So agreed. You know, it's, yeah. And I'm always hassling. Right? There, there's no end of ideas for like, I've probably got six, seven different shows I'd like to do, but it just becomes a time aspect of it. Exactly. So I'm forever hitting her up in the DMs and saying, I've got this idea. She's like, Oh, what do you got now? So <laughs> it's kind of fun, but yeah, it's purely a, uh, it's an engagement, it's entertainment and that sort of thing. And I've had, you know, I've, I'm sure you probably get it yourself where people say, oh, you're a whale or this, that and the other thing because they see your account. Like like I said, my, my net worth in my account is whatever it is, 140 million if you click on my profile. But that's, I haven't put that money into the game. That's two and a half years worth of grinding and, you know, Taking advantage of opportunities that come along, yep. you know, seeing plans through to fruition. It's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's not, um, it's, it's laughable, really. People say you're a whale. It's unfair. I'm like, mate, I, if you just knew my in real life situation, you would just laugh your ass off. Like I'm a <laughs> kindergarten teacher. We're like the lowest paid professionals out there. It's just, it's yep. just hilarious. Like I'm, I'm talking to you on what is essentially a five-year-old laptop and, there's been several UDU team meetings or we've been on the one chi show and my laptop has crashed and died 
and I'd love to get a new laptop, but it's it's just not it's not an option in our budget. I have to work with what we've got to work with. Yeah. Well, all of that is super respectful, honestly, that at everything you're doing with the community, everything you're working on, and especially with, you know, having a fat wife and kids and being, you know, clearly a really involved parent and 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 all of that like it's really really cool to speak with you and learn everything that you've been involved in um i think we've been going on close to two hours uh i'm i'm impressed i've got a big Um, motor mouth as shown by my (laughs) discord avatar it's my big motor mouth so yeah no i love it um this has been really great uh content that i'm excited to put out there and share with everyone and to bring to light all the cool things that so many people are doing in the community. I think that's one of the biggest things I hope people take from this new type of content I'm working on with these interviews is just there's so much going on and I just want to see more people come up with their own ideas and bring it into the Upland Metaverse because they're really it. Like the sky's the limit and that's what I'm most excited about. And uh, I really appreciate your time and your willingness to be on the show with how busy your schedule is. No worries, mate. It's like it's one of these things where, and I've been guilty of this myself. It's very easy to get, very easy to get caught up in the fud or the the kind of frustrating points of Upland and the metaverse and all that sort of stuff. But yeah, especially this year, I've really focused on just um, focusing on what matters, what what is most entertaining and rewarding for me, and just putting all my time and effort into that, like. Um, it's kicked off on Twitter where, you know, you get attacked by by various people accusing you of this, that, and the other thing where previously that used to really get to me and I'd try and justify things. But if, if you're talking to somebody who's who's in that mentality, you just got to walk away. So it's, yeah, focus on what you're, what you're interested in and make it what you want. That's, um, yeah, it's, it's really the, the opportunities that are here now are, uh, pretty mind-blowing like like you say if if you took a step back and look at it from a year ago you'd think what the hell um the opportunities that are presenting themselves moving forward well, it's it's you know it's limitless basically it truly is it truly is yep. thank you so much again ben for being on the show really appreciate you and hope to have you again in the future at some point to see all the new things i, I mean maybe we'll, we'll see how fast you're able to get your decor shop and how things develop there. Excited to see what comes out of that and everything UDU and MVE and all these other things you're working on that, that, that continues to get developed. Excited to stay tuned. And uh, again, really appreciate you coming on. Cheers, mate. Thank you for having me on.